we're going to get started on time. We have a, a really uh, awesome session today. Uh, our guest, Ken Summers, uh, he's founded and successfully exited, exited three startups over a 16 year period. Uh, Ken teaches uh, B2B sales for startups, uh, an IAP course at MIT, and is a visiting lecturer at Harvard Business School. Uh, Kent is an executive leadership coach at the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative, ALI, uh, on the teaching faculty of Thai Boston and uh, the Mastering Sales Program at uh, Kellogg, Northwestern Kellogg. And he serves on the board of Sigma Labs, a NASDAQ company, as well as um, IQ3 Connect. So uh, welcome, Kent, to our session. Uh, just some housekeeping items. Uh, if you have uh, really specific questions about your business, uh, please try to keep them more general uh, so that we don't spend a lot of time answering your specific questions. And uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Kent and we'll, we'll leave the questions to the end, but feel free to send them uh, by private message to me so we, that we can uh, moderate them. Uh, Kent, over to you. Uh, Joe, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I've got you for an hour today and I think an hour, another hour uh, on Thursday. It's um, very nice to, um, to be with you today. Um, we're going to cover uh, a very small select set of material from my uh, full lecture series here. I've chosen um, some material uh, intentionally that I think will um, help um, help you improve your, your sales performance and your efficiency. Um, I'm, I, I don't have a lot of patience for theory. Um, I'm really all about tactics and trade craft and skills and knowledge. So um, my goal here uh, today and over Thursday is that um, you walk away with a better understanding and maybe a, a, a better mindset and a few skills that you can apply uh, to your Start up your scale up to help improve uh, your sales. So with that, um, I'll start by sharing some good news. Um, is my experience as a founder. Um, there's only two things you need to worry about, uh, and that's revenue and everything else. And uh, I figured that out early after I started running out of uh, runway and spending more time. Kent, more I don't think, are you are you sharing your screen? Can't see your screen. Yes, I am. Can you can you see me? I can see you, but not your screen. Um, hang on a second here. Yeah, that good news I was sharing with you. It's uh, revenue and everything else. Um, it turns out if you're unable to get re revenue flowing, um, everything else doesn't matter. However, once you get cash in the door. Um, then all the other things, the myriad things that you do as a founder, all of a sudden seem manageable. So if you're unable to figure out at some point in your startup journey how to acquire customers cost-effectively, game over. So that's really what I want to help you with. Um, I focus on uh, B2B sales. Uh, I assume uh, presume most of you here are uh, in, in the B2B uh, marketplace, uh, which is a, a completely different animal from, from B2C sales. Uh, what is B2B sales? Uh, well, it's you as a smaller business selling to a larger business, and you are solving um, necessarily goals, problems, needs that are complex. Uh, if they weren't complex, they wouldn't be problems or they would probably already be solved. And it's typically solved by you thinking about a different, uh, better, faster, cheaper way, um, leveraging innovation to solve those problems, which involves people doing something differently. Um, enterprise sales involves higher priced offerings and it's not necessarily related to your COGS, what it takes you to build and, and deliver and service your product, uh, their higher price offerings, uh, more based upon the scale of the problem that you're solving. So for example, if you're solving a $1 problem for a million people, it's a million dollar problem that you're solving. Enterprise sales almost always involves unknowns and uncertainties and understanding from a sales perspective how to manage those is very, very important. 
Um, in addition, um, enterprise sales, B2B sales, almost always replaces something or someone inside or outside the organization. It's critically important to understand um, who or what or both your solution displaces as part of the sales process. Um, enterprise sales are also um, involved because people are involved, uh, a lot's hidden agenda and forces. And so um, part of the skills as a salesperson is to uh, have the ability and the understanding of asking the right questions of people to surface those uh, agendas and forces so that you can manage them head on versus uh, deal with them, um, deal with the uh, outcome of those. Um, it's very seldom that an enterprise sale, the same person will evaluate the offering, make the decision and write the check. It's almost always the case that enterprise sales involves a team purchasing uh, decision where the, uh, those aspects of the sale are distributed amongst uh, four, five, six people in the organization. And because of all this, B2B sales has a much longer expensive sales cycle. Um, sales is your most expensive investment in terms of real cost and in terms of oppor uh, opportunity cost. Um, it's expensive to get right, uh, but it's very expensive uh, if you get it wrong. So a little bit about the mindset in sales. Um, and, and this is a really important uh, part of sales. It's not just tools, it's not just skills, it's about having uh, a proper mindset, uh, which might be a little bit different than how you think about um, the sales profession or sales people. Um, so contrary to what you uh, might have understood, um, sales is not about chasing people down to close deals. It's about helping people achieve a goal, solve a problem, or satisfy a need by coincidentally purchasing your product or service. And it turns out that if you're successful helping people, transactions will naturally occur. So think about transactions or sales is an outcome measure and that your, uh, your attitude and your behavior with people in, in your competence in helping people solve their problem as the leading indicators of that outcome measure. Sales is also not about picking winners uh, and losers. Um, we learned a long time ago and working for the past 20 years at MIT that uh, we're not very good at that. It's about um, helping people shape and navigate and pivot and change. Uh, and the successful companies that leave MIT bear very little resemblance to what they look like when we first started working with them. So if you were to pick uh, winning customers or customers that you think are gonna close um, and those that you do not think uh, are going to close, um, you're probably wasting a lot of your time and you're missing out on opportunities. So just like startups, sales are not about picking winners and losers. It's about feeding a process where at the end of the day, there's only two things that you control as a founder, your attitude and your behavior. So I'm gonna be, these are sort of overriding themes that um, I'm gonna be talking about um, over the course of the next hour is, you know, how do you, how do you modify, how do you control um, your attitude and your behaviors and use them wisely uh, to improve your sales performance. And it turns out that, um, Sales, uh, uh, people are not born with a, uh, a sales gene. It's not something that um, you learn in school. It's something that you learn through practice and, and repetition, just like anything else. And most technical founders can be very, very good at sales. And of course, the ones that survive always figure it out. So the sales role itself is the business profession closest to a full contact sport. And like an athlete, um, they require talent, 
coaching, team play, and great execution skills. Uh, the sales profession is also a numbers game with a very unattractive win-loss ratio. Um, enterprise sales is a 90% plus failure driven activity. Um, I'd like to share with you as a failure driven um, activity, everybody at MIT has their own uh, formulas and algorithms. And so of course I had to come up with one on my own here for sales. I call it SW cubed over M. No, for salespeople in a failure-driven profession, this stands for some will, some won't, so what, next. There's your attitude for selling into a failure-driven profession. Let me share with you that if you only fail 10% in, in sales, you will be an extremely um, successful entrepreneur and you will be the exception. The reality is in sales um, that the failure rate is closer to 97 or 98%. Um, a lot of sales books will tell you, and you've probably heard before if you've read any of them, that sales is always about qualifying customers, always be qualifying. Um, I, I disagree with that um, strongly. I believe that qualified customers are really, really easy to spot. I think that effective sales is about disqualifying people with the appearance of real and helping people to opt in and opt out of your process by asking questions, not by making statements. So failure uh, is the name of the game. It's not about failure avoidance. It's about failure recovery. And um, in the sales profession, unlike a, a professional Baseball coach, you can you can lose 90% of your uh, your games and still keep your job. Um, the founder is always the first salesperson. Why? Well, you have intimate knowledge of the offering, the customer, the need, the problem. Uh, you also, uh, and and of course, the value that you're uh, delivering people. You also have this skewed view of the world. Right, you have a different way of, of looking at things. Uh, this distorted uh, view of reality, it helps you overcome. This is your vision here. This is, this is why you founded your company. Um, and importantly, you as a founder need to understand firsthand all the blocking issues that prevent customers from writing you a check. Right, all this early product market feedback this is really essential, especially as you transition from a sort of a vision whiteboard view of things to your product market fit, where you start to influence your product roadmap more so from trends and patterns that you see from talking with many, many uh, different customers. And it's these feature requests and rejections here that, that give you, that afford you that, that precious fuel for your, your product roadmap. Now, in case um, uh, some or many of you have not already experienced this already, um, one of the things that um, I've uh, has become clear to me uh, over the past 20 years working with founders is that if you really want your, your company to fail, go out and hire a professional salesperson. We see this time and time again where startups fail when the founder believes that bringing in a salesperson will solve the sales dilemma. Um, to the contrary, this is usually an accelerant to failure and it becomes a very expensive um, learning uh, exercise for, for the founder and very, very rarely works out. So um, in my, my normal, um, lecture material, I have a whole bunch of material at this point where I talk about the successful tr uh, personality and skill traits of a salesperson, what makes them tick, uh, what makes them successful. Um, again, I had to really limit what, what I covered with you in a short time period today. So I thought what might be more impactful is that we just jump straight into uh, the sale, uh, sales toolkit and mechanics. So with that, um, 
is a failure driven profession and a numbers game, it's really uh, about prospecting, right? And when you're playing a numbers game, you have to have a tool, so you have to have a game plan, you have to have tools and a methodology, uh, which are essential for your focus in your efficiency. And answering the question that you have every morning when you wake up and when you're looking at uh, many more opportunities than you have time to address. And that is what's the most productive use of my time today. So there's two tools um, that um, can help you with. The first is the customer profile. And this is the criteria, very specific criteria that you rely on to focus your daily sales activity. And then secondly, once you figure that out, uh, your sales pipeline also called your funnel, and this is your methodology that you use to drive focus and efficiency. This is a time management tool for you. So let's start with the profile. Um, the profile is what you rely on to focus your sales activity. It consists of three components. At the outside ring here is your company profile. This is your target customer, and they exist within a specific industry, a type of company within that industry, size, and geography. So for example, I'm targeting financial services company of type family offices with over 100 million under management within 25 miles of Boston. That would be a very good example of a well-defined company profile. Um, the company profile, if it's well-defined, one of the asset tests there is you should be able to get companies' addresses from this. If you have a good profile, you should be able to, with a good search, um, come up with a, a long list of companies uh, in their specific spe uh, street ad address that meets that. Um, inside the company profile is the buyer profile. This is the person inside that company that stands to gain the most or lose the most from your offering. So the buyer profile is determined by <clears throat> a job title or role with resp uh, specific responsibilities and unmet needs, often um, expressed in the form of a, of a use case. So in the prior example here, uh, this would be uh, a, a research analyst who's responsible for vetting um, investment opportunities and is using very old, outdated, inefficient, and error-prone research methods. And then lastly, uh, at the center of your profile is the decision-making unit. And this is the, uh, the folks inside that organization that make decisions, they influence the decisions, and they have access to a checkbook. And it's very different in every organization depending upon uh, the people, their culture, et cetera, and especially in, in, in much larger uh, companies. So these are the three components of a, a customer profile. <clears throat> and it's really, really important that as you go and figure this out, this is not just something that comes out of your business plan. This is something that you learn and fine tune after talking with 100 or 200 prospects. And you eventually get it down to where it's fairly chiseled down. And um, I recommend as you go through this process, if you do have a co-founder or other people on your team to engage everybody <clears throat> on your team while figuring this out. Um, some recommendations uh, in terms of questions that you ask people in figuring this out uh, that, that have helped me in the past. Um, gather facts, not opinions. Um, a lot of people fail in their in their customer customer profile development by asking people if they would do something if or would they do something if and people love to share their opinions and theory and so forth but that's not helpful um, i recommend that you gather facts uh, uh, against what you're selling into don't ask people would you do something but ask them do you do something so facts not opinions and facts related to pain and cost, not 
theoretical or implied gains, right? Which is very um, difficult to measure. So figure out where the pain and the cost is related to those facts. In facts, pain and cost um, related to a single use case, right? Now, of course, early on, pursuing multiple scenarios is necessary as you're sort of figuring out your product market fit. But many founders, if you ask them, well, who your customer is, they may give you two or three or four different use case scenarios. Uh, I strongly recommend focusing on, on one uh, because trying to chase down three or four in parallel can be hugely dilutive uh, to, your, uh, to your focus. And at the end of the day, there's only one validate, uh, validation of a customer profile. And that is you receive purchase orders from different companies to solve a similar problem. So different companies solve a similar problem. And by the way, this is actually, from an investor perspective, the bona fide definition of MVP, right? You do not have MVP if you do not have three or four or six companies that are different where you're solving a similar problem. So this is your, um, your customer profile. Once you, um, once you figure out and fine tune your customer profile, now you've got basically the framework from which you can go out and you can procure leads, which are the raw material of sales. So I'm gonna talk about um, the pipeline process now from, from lead to close, where those leads come from, um, how they're managed throughout the sales process um, and how you think about the sales process, um, you know, from a, from a stage to stage uh, perspective. <clears throat> so sales pipeline here also called a funnel. Uh, it looks like a funnel. You've got leads coming in uh, the top uh, to suspects, prospects, opportunities, and customers. Suspects are where you, um, you take leads and you filter them to meet your specific customer profile criteria. Not all leads are gonna meet that criteria. You need to winnow out the ones uh, that don't meet that specific criteria. The tighter the criteria, the better. Um, moving on, prospects um, are uh, suspects who you've contacted and confirm that the buyer profile exists within that uh, customer profile. And um, of the few prospects that you talk to that meet that profile, that also express genuine interest in that the problem that you're solving is a priority, they become opportunities that you, these are folks that are actively engaged in your sales process where you're developing and closing them. The length of time it takes you to do this is your sales cycle. <clears throat> and um, there's these um, things that occur between these stages called conversion metrics. Um, I'll explain in just a minute why they're, they're very important to you. They help you in sales. Uh, and there's two things that occur as part of the sales process that actually shape this into a funnel. There's triage and attrition. Uh, triage is uh, you moving people out of the funnel because you don't believe they're qualified to take your time. And attrition is people leaving your life, kicking you out of their funnel uh, because they don't believe you're qualified to take their time. After you've figured out your customer uh, profile with your team. This is not uh, the top end of your funnel. Uh, the suspects and prospects is not where you want to engage your team. They, they're barely, barely qualified to take your time, let alone people on your team's time. So this is your job as a founder, as a salesperson, is to move people through the suspect prospect conversion. Conversely, when they make it to opportunities, the opposite is true. This is exactly where you need to invest uh, your team's time and exposure to the customer for lots of reasons that I'll explain um, later on today. Uh, and that is <clears throat> expanding beyond the one-on-one -on -one conversation, getting, getting away from 
having a conversation with a single person, uh, it, a prospective customer, and successful, <clears throat> successful sales is rather your ability to connect people on your team with people on the buyer's team. And the better you get at that, the more likely you will be uh, having a paying customer. Now in a mature company, um, each one of these stages is actually a formal, highly specialized business discipline. So for example, you'll have marketing people who are responsible for not only building awareness, uh, but also generating leads. And when they generate leads, which meet the company profile, they hand those over to inside salespeople, also called sales development rep, uh, representatives or SDRs. And um, SDRs, they get, you know, this is your a rite of passage as a salesperson, as a young salesperson, you get on the phone and you just start ambushing people on the phone and cold calling them. And, you know, most of your life you're getting your teeth kicked in, but every once in a while you'll, you'll get somebody where uh, it resonates. And when you find somebody that meets your qualification criteria, the SDR hands that, that person off to field sales who has a much better, well-developed set of skills to um, develop that opportunity and close that opportunity. And of course, field sales cannot be burdened by un ongoing customer uh, retention and satisfaction. So as soon as practical, they transition the primary relationship in that account over to an account manager. And uh, the field salesperson is the hunter and the account manager is the farmer, completely different sales, sales uh, skill sets and personalities. Um, the field salesperson is about um, new, new account acquisition, where the farmer, the account manager, their job is to maximize the yield within the uh, account. Now, for, um, for founders, uh, fortunately, this is a, a lot more simple uh, for you. You don't have to think about all these roles. You get to do them all yourself. Uh, but I think it's important to understand here that behind the scenes here, uh, of all these things that you need to do as a founder, as a small team, this is how you eventually scale your go-to-market team into separate, distinct uh, professional uh, skill sets and roles. Well, the sales pipeline defines the sequential named steps of your sales process that help you organize uh, and focus your time and also balance your sales activity. And I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double back on that balance here uh, in a moment because uh, it's a very important uh, part of a uh, successful uh, sales skill set. Suspects are filtered leads that meet your company profile, also called MQLs or marketing qualified leads. Prospects are uh, initial contact with that customer verifies that the buyer profile and the buyer interest exist. This is also called sales qualified leads or SQLs. Opportunities are uh, in your pipeline. These are qualified prospects that are actively engaged in your sales process where you are um, developing the decision-making unit. And of course, we all know what customers are. These are the conversion metrics I was talking about before. Um, generally speaking, these are good rule of thumb metrics here. In other words, uh, one out of 10 suspect uh, becomes a prospect. Um, and one, you know, one and a half uh, prospect becomes an opportunity. Uh, well, maybe, uh, 15 15 percent of the time and about a third of the time you should close an opportunity as a customer the point here is they increase they should intentionally increase increase left to right right um, if they are not increasing left to right significantly um, you, the criteria that you're employing to um, allow people to take up your valuable time is uh, not well defined enough. It's too broad. 
and you need to tighten down your uh, your your criteria. Um, so this will help you debug your sales process. Um, and conversion metrics are also uh, one of the few, if any, um, objective metrics uh, for sales forecasting. And I'll um, I'll cover that in just a moment. So a lot of people tend to get um, there's a little confusion um, between MQLs and SQLs and sales and, and the interaction between sales and marketing. So I think about it like how would somebody, how would I want somebody to explain the difference between these things to somebody like me, right? And the answer here is um, MQLs, they want to know what kind of cookies you have and SQLs, you verified that they have a $10 budget and they're deciding between Thin Mints and Oreos. So that's the difference between MQLs and SQLs. So all sales starts with a lead. Um, and in B2C sales, by contrast, the websites do all the heavy lifting where the salesperson supports that. And in um, B2B sales, it's e exactly the opposite. Um, the, uh, the, the, B2, uh, the B2B salesperson does all the heavy lifting and that website is just a support. Um, websites never close deals in B2B sales, but they're really, really good at preventing them from happening. And uh, I can't tell you how many times that I've seen um, early stage entrepreneurs overbuild their website and talk about um, uh, their solution in excruciating detail to where as people visit, um, and they, there's so much information there, um, they're overwhelmed and they don't really walk away with a clear understanding of what you do. Or worse, um, they overemphasize the tool and the capabilities and the features and they, they forget about the, the why and the problem and the outcome measures. Um, there's lots of reasons why web, websites um, are, are good at preventing B2B sales. So a couple of things to keep in mind here you know, um, diminishing return on people's attention uh, in sales occurs very early. So you've got basically 30 seconds to make it really, really clear to people what you sell and how it fits into their world. Speak to their world and just make them curious to learn more. Don't, don't over engineer the website with more information because you're never ever gonna have a chance to talk to them if you provide too much information on the website, right? So it's about your clarity of thinking here, right? Uh, more concepts, illustration, very, very crisp uh, messaging, right? Um, and think about your customer, right? Think about their world, who, who are they, right? Is it really, really clear from your messaging um, that um, the person visiting your website is exactly the type of person that you're serving here and show this person within 10 seconds how it directly benefits them, right? Uh, and it's benefits supported by features and capabilities, not the reverse. So your goal here is within two or three or maybe five minutes on a website is to create somebody who is going to champion you, to bring you back to the organization in the context of an initiative or a project that's relevant to your offering here to say, hey, this is one of the things we need to look at here. Help them sell that story. But make them come back to you for detail. The leads are the raw material of sales. Uh, there's uh, fundamentally, there's two methods. There's outbound leads. And these are um, um, outreach programs. Uh, to uh, targeted company profiles, groups of prospects to solicit their interest, right? There's lots of different, very traditional ways of doing this. And with the advent of the internet, and especially the development of lots more advanced sales and marketing tools, especially over the last 10 years, um, there's um, actually a, a much more efficient method of gathering leads called inbound, where um, search engine optimization and pay-per-click are how you acquire new leads. They're fundamentally different approaches. 
Um, outbound, the, the prospective uh, seller initiates the contract, uh, the contact with the buyer and uh, in, um, in inbound SEO and PPC, uh, the reverse is true. The buyer thinks they reach, they find you, they reach out to you, they contact you. Um, because of this, people's needs, attention, and priorities is established in inbound lead generation where it is not established in outbound. So what kind of skills do you need? Depending upon um, how you're generating leads, you have to be very good at direct marketing. Uh, if you're relying on outbound for primarily for your lead generation. Um, if you're relying <clears throat> on um, SEO and PPC, it has to be your skills for inbound. You have to learn about search engine optimization and keyword density and metadata and all the campaigns and obscurities of figuring out the big black box of Google and how they run their algorithms and, and all the all the, um, the the tricks in 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 with getting better at driving people to your website without spending more money, and at the end of the day, it does come down to money. Your sales economics, and that's why um, I'm a big fan of inbound, is because inbound lead gen. Once you figure it out, and it will require quite a bit of an experimentation, but once you figure it out, the cost to um, continue and grow your company and grow your revenues, the cost of SEO and PPC does not grow proportionate to your revenue, right? It tends to flatten off, in which case your cost of sales goes down over time, where in um, outbound direct marketing, the, um, the cost of sales tends to be fairly proportionate to your, to your revenue as, as a percentage. So um, these are the big uh, difference here between the two in terms of who initiates the contact and whether people's needs and priorities are established. Um, outbound uh, email campaigns, et cetera. Um, the, the, the big thing today is to outsource your, your SDR functions. There's actually quite a few organizations now in, in the US uh, that will perform this SDR function for you as a virtual SDR function. Um, if you are going to bring it in-house, um, you know, their job is to find qualified prospects and to um, have meetings with those people, with your salespeople, and to have those uh, meetings convert into paying customers. Just a rule of thumb here on compensating SDRs in-house is um, you, um, it, you, you compensate SDRs for both meetings, but you also compensate them for conversions at a one to 10 ratio. So if you're paying an SDR $25 every time they get a meeting with your sales rep, they get $250 every time one of those converts to a paying customer. Inbound SEO and pay-per-click, uh, it requires a significant upfront investment in my experience um, and a lot of ongoing experimentation to figure out how you can optimize your spend here. Um, if you have a unique, highly innovative offering, and I run into these all the time at MIT, uh, it's really important that you optimize your website and your SEO and PPC spend around the problem you solve, not your solution. People don't know what your solution is, but they're searching on their problem. So you have to think about it a little bit differently if uh, you have a highly innovative offering. And these are dramatically different approaches, inbound and outbound, right? Especially in terms of the buyer-seller dynamics. They're both expensive, uh, but the opportunity cost is more expensive. You just have to get in there. A lot of companies experiment with both. Uh, the more successful companies that I've worked with and developed over the years eventually become centered on SEO and PPC uh, just because of the, the, the sales economics. So a couple of basic rules for customer prospecting. Um, 
keep your, your communication brief and to the point in sales. As I mentioned before, um, diminishing returns on people attention occurs very uh, quickly in sales. So be very, very brief and to the point and keep your interaction, uh, your interaction with people uh, in sales narrow and well-defined, right? Um, a big uh, mistake I see uh, a lot of people make is a founder will get um, somebody that shows good interest and meets all their buying criteria on the phone and just wears them out over the course of an hour, an hour and a half covering every one, every aspect of their business, right? Try to resist the temptation of stuffing multiple steps of your sales process into a single interaction. Leave room for relationship building. Very important. Also, another common mistake, uh, you get an email from somebody that you don't know asking you to solve their problem, and it's exactly the type of problem that you solve. Do you send them an email um, solving their problem? or show, telling them how you would solve their problem. Why is that a lose-lose proposition? Well, lots of reasons. One is, <clears throat> it turns out that despite um, years of English class uh, and writing um, through grade school and college, not too many people are great at communicating uh, and writing, especially, or people are in a hurry and they give you half the story or worse, they give you the whole story and you solve it and they have no reason to contact you, right? You miss the opportunity for the person-to-person -person interaction. So my recommendation is whenever you get an email, and I don't care what they're asking for, if it's remotely related to sales, send the same response. Hey, you know what? This sounds like something we can help you with. Please send me days, times, you're available, give them your time zone, and you will confirm a phone call to discuss. If it's a legitimate interest in your company, a legitimate prospective buyer, 90% of the time, you'll get people to respond back to you affirmatively with days and times in the following week. This works very, very well, right? So don't try to, don't try to sell over email. Get people on Zoom, get people on the phone. People have different preferences for that, by the way. Try to understand early on what their preference is. And if you have trouble reaching people, try a little bit inside and outside of uh, ordinary hours, right? Um, or five minutes before the hour, people tend to be hanging around their phones if they're planning to make a call. Um, obviously, you're not gonna be selling something to people in five minutes, but you can get on their calendar. Uh, this is a pet peeve of mine as a founder, um, especially important when you're a small company is use the word we instead of I. It's a very subtle, but it's a very powerful word. Uh, you want people, you want to give people the perception they're working with a company, not an individual. So it's very important that you appear bigger and more professional than you actually are. And by using the term we, you can actually accomplish that. Uh, when you're prospecting, um, it's very important to be sensitive to other people's uh, time and pressures on the job. Um, sales, a lot of sales is about ambushing people's calendars and getting on people's calendars where it's unplanned. And you have to be very mindful and very gracious about getting on people's calendars, thanking them and just saying, hey, listen, we just need 20 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever, but it's about getting people on their calendars and respecting the fact that they're busy and they're, they have lots of different priorities. And making sure that when you do show up on their calendar and when you do have an interaction with them, that you add value with every interaction, right? Take those phone calls to ask good questions, but offer people help, offer them guidance, offer them insight, right? If you provide value, in these conversations, people are going to want to talk to you, right? They're not going to talk to you out of obligation. They're not going to talk to you out of courtesy. They're going to talk to you because you've been helpful. Um, and it's important to be serious about your business. It's important to be serious about your product. Just don't take yourself too seriously in sales, right? Um, 
sales can be anxious enough, right? Try to keep your manner, your tone light. Um, I call this the behavioral equivalent of office casual dress code, right? Um, you know, uh, be a little bit more relaxed, I think helps other people uh, become relaxed. And you can be very formal and professional uh, about your knowledge and your competence and the information you share to help people, but you don't have to be so formal in terms of your, your manner and your, and your tone. And always afford people an out and see if they take it. Um, I'm a big fan of this. Um, I think on um, Thursday, we're gonna be talking a lot about some very specific skills, um, what I call off ramps to help people opt in or opt out of your sales process uh, to actually solicit clear buying and stalling signals that are actionable uh, by you because otherwise um, people may have their own agenda and not wish to send you these signals. So it's important for you as a salesperson to have these skills and ability to, to, um, to um, help people either opt in or opt out of your, your process. Now, of course, we all have uh, bad days. And um, you know, as it turns out, when you're working uh, in sales, um, the further you go in a conversation, the more expensive they come. And sometimes you arrive at work uh, and you just feel like, well, you've got to get the job done, but you're not quite on that day. Um, my, my, uh, another strong recommendation that I've learned just from um, uh, my own experience uh, doing sales is, you know, when you're having those bad days, don't interact with people in sales. You know, go to the movies, don't interact with any humans. And when you're having those positive mojo days, that's when you make those important calls. So a um, couple of uh, basic rules of customer prospecting. Law number one, you're gonna interact with 100 prospects for every one to three that close. And at the outset, they all appear the same and there are no shortcuts, right? You must touch everyone to determine who's real. And to my earlier point, prospects who are a great fit, they're easy to spot. It's the ones that are not a good fit that are more difficult to spot. So there's a couple of things to think about there in terms of how you, how you go about that. Prospecting law four, you're always going to have to make decisions in sales with an incomplete set of information, right? Which is anathema to the engineering mindset. If you don't have a complete set of information, it won't compile, right? Uh, in sales, overanalyzing something, belaboring incomplete knowledge will not help you. You must learn to trust your instinct and take action on what you feel is important. You have to feel confident about moving, as confident about moving people out of your pipeline as you do forward in your pipeline. And you've been working on a deal for a while. It doesn't, uh, they decided to go in a different direction. You just don't dwell upon them. You've got your little uh, W3C uh, cubed over N uh, poster in your office there. And you're just like, um, uh, no, no problem. Um, timing is also a, a big challenge in sales here. Um, and uh, it's actually an enigma in sales because it's very, very different, uh, difficult to manage. And one of the ways that I've developed over years is a way of thinking about timing is, is treating your expensive opportunities in your pipeline like perishable food. So for example, there's these deals that you know are gonna make a decision in the next days or weeks inside a month these have to be out on your kitchen table. Uh, they're gonna be a meal for somebody. They're gonna make a decision. They're gonna buy from somebody, maybe not you, but this meal is gonna get eaten, right? And you need to pay attention to it and they get more touches, more, more of your time versus those things in the refrigerator where the decision um, date might be a little bit further out, <clears throat> next couple of months, next, next couple of quarters. 
right? Where instead of two to three touches a week, it's more one to two touches a month versus those things that are in the freezer that are not actively driving toward a decision date, but you may be helping to influence something in the next year's budget where you need to, you need to touch base with them every three to six months, certainly not months and certainly not weeks or, or days. So these are all fully qual these are all fully quali qualified opportunity. The only difference here is timing, right? And the frequency of your sales activity. So highly perishable deals, two to three a week, one to two a month, and three to six months. So the reality in sales is you're getting up in the morning, you're looking at your pipeline. First thing you do is you open the refrigerator. You say, okay, what are we gonna eat this week or next week? And what belongs in the freezer? Stuff you've been, you've been pawing through in your pipeline for too long, it's not closing. Uh, you put that in your freezer for your drip campaign or something else. It's still a qualified deal. It's just a timing issue. Maybe they pushed it off a year. Uh, and always you're alert to those things which are sending short-term buying signals where you have to really focus your attention. Uh, and you, you'll do the best job you possibly can in sort of organizing your deals around timing. But the reality is you're going to uncover a lot of um, opportunities that send you strong buying signals and go nowhere. And to the contrary, you're going to encounter opportunities that you swear are a perfect fit or, or not a perfect fit um, and you scratch their head and they decide that they wanna become your customer. And the, the timing of course is a mystery, right? Uh, especially when you don't have a way of thinking about it or a way of managing it. So in sales, there's only so much under your influence and control and, and it, much, is up, much in sales is up to <clears throat> many other things way outside your control. You just can't fr uh, fret over the unpredictable nature of sales because you have to control your attitude and your behavior. So with the few minutes left that we have here today, I want to um, just talk about a little bit about um, attitude and behavior and give you some examples uh, for team sales and communication here. And then um, I don't know what people's time frames are, but I'm kind of um, I'm going to run over the time here and give you some time to ask some Q&A at the end here, Joe, so <clears throat> in case that's uh, needed. So in, um, in my experience, um, working with and at many startups in, in my career um, in sales, uh, attitude and behavior are the two best predictors of sales success. <clears throat> uh, and, um, you know, the, um, the uh, efficiency uh, and performance are the are basically mutually exclu exclusive uh, in in most professions. The faster you do it, the uh, the <clears throat> the lower the quality, and vice versa. Uh, sales is the same. You want to be very efficient, but you get diminishing returns on efficiency uh, on your per performance. So the most efficient salesperson is the pusher. <clears throat> um, this person they drive aggressively toward a yes or no. Um, and they're extremely efficient at doing that. Um, they're not very helpful. In fact, well, th they'll help you, they'll help you borrow their pen to sign an agreement. Uh, I, I, I checked that. That's about it. The extent to which they'll help you, right? But they're all about driving people to purpose, uh, to purchase. Their performance is, is lousy, <clears throat> but they're the most efficient salespeople on the planet. Next one on the line is what I call the dreamer, the hoper and the dreamer. This is the person that uh, active, they're not quite sure how to help people, but they're always hopeful and optimistic. Um, and you can tell a hoper and, and dreamer because they have a bloated pipeline, right? So instead of, uh, you know, a <clears throat> hundred um, prospects and opportunities they're working, they may have 400 people in the pipeline because they're too afraid to throw something out for it not, uh, uh, they're wishing and hoping versus being proactive. The mechanic is the next step in the process. This is the person that uh, is more skilled and that will recognize 
the absence of buying signals and feel quite comfortable about moving on and put, putting somebody outside of their, uh, their scope of activity. And then lastly is the facilitator. And this is the person that's mastered in <clears throat> helping prospects sell themselves or opt out. This is not a salesperson. This is a facilitator. This is somebody that's working with people and asking the right questions and people either sell themselves or, or they don't. And it's a diff very different type of sales animal. So attitude and behavior, the two best predictors of sales success. Remember, it's not B2B, it's not B2C. Sales is about P2P, person to person. People buy from people, not from companies, right? And because of that, salespeople often make a huge error of jumping directly into problem solving mode by impressing people of their knowledge and how they good, are, are good at solving their problems, right? Buyers, however, often can find that threatening and are reluctant <clears throat> to have you solve their problem until that empathy and trust is established. And I don't know how many folks on the online here are married. This is a lesson I learned from my wife 20 years ago. It was a hard lesson that when she um, would explain a problem to me, if I jumped into fix mode, it usually had a really, really horrible outcome. And all I had to sit back when and just say, I really understand your pain. And I was in a much better position doing that than trying to fix it. Sales is very similar, right? Resist the temptation to fix people's problems and convince them that you really understand their problem and that you have their best interest in mind. So I'm gonna talk about that. The four pillars of building a successful buyer-seller relationship starts with empathy. Convincing people you truly understand their need and their pain, which leads to trust, right? You have their best interest in mind, which means as part of the sales process, hey, listen, I'm gonna ask you some questions. Uh, you know, if it turns out that um, I don't think we can help you or you're not the best fit for me, believe me, I will be the first to raise my hand. And if I can, I'm going to point you in another direction. <clears throat> I know a lot of other vendors in this space or other people. I just want to make sure you get something that's the best for you, right? You have to convince people that um, you are serving their best interest. Empathy and trust is the foundation of sales. Once you establish that foundation, then you can begin to express the value of their offering in their terms, in their world. Not your value proposition, but their value proposition. How is your product valuable? What is the outcome measure of your offering in their word, world and their terms? And then finally, if they buy into that and they say, yeah, that's exactly the outcome that we're looking for, then you can move on to competence, right? You can talk about your product and your team and how you're capable and you're up to the task. These are the four pillars of building a successful buyer relationship. Too often, I, I see people uh, going in the reverse direction and attempting to build a relationship backwards by trying to convince people of um, how knowledgeable they are or talking feature function and value prop and whatever, that's backwards. That's a fatal error in sales. Start with empathy and trust, build toward value in their terms and earn the right uh, to uh, share how competent you are. Jumping straight to the fix or your capabilities, it's often viewed as dismissive of their unique circumstances, think about it, right? So your strengths, right, become a gift only after people are convinced that you really understand their specific unique needs and have their best interests in mind. And in the absence of that trust, right, your competence, understand that your competence can be viewed as insulting or aggressive, right? You mean, oh, I've been suffering over this for nine months and you're gonna solve it in two minutes? How dumb am I? Or 
you know what, I haven't told you the whole story yet and you're trying to fix it. You've only got a quarter of the story, right? So think about your approach here. In sales, competence is always valued, but it's usually measured last. After several interactions, look for a shift in the prospect's attitude from sell me to let's solve this together. And if you've attempted and you've established trust and you've established empathy, but still fail to win the deal, don't personalize the rejection, right? It's a numbers driven game. It's not a referendum on your knowledge or ability. It's just the wrong company, wrong person, bad timing, take your pick. Uh, I've got a couple more slides here, Joe, then we can move to some Q&A, is that all right? Sure, sure, go ahead, Scott. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I said at the outset here that sales is not about picking winners and losers, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples why. Uh, if you're a top opportunity focus salesperson, you spend 90 to 100% of your time chasing down the two or three deals that you feel are most likely to close, and you're ignoring everything else in your funnel. You're ignoring new leads, you're ignoring developing leads and opportunities, and this is what your life is going to look like. It's going to look like Groundhog Day, right? Because by the time you put all the effort in to close that deal, you'll have disremembered everything else in your pipeline, or it's gone in another direction. So you get you, you, you get the deal, you win some, you lose some, uh, but it's up and down and it's Groundhog Day versus a balanced sales activity where you invest half your time in those top deals and you distribute the other half of your time amongst the other different areas of your pipeline, developing the rest of the funnel, um, qualifying, moving prospects to suspects, nurturing other people in your pipeline. Uh, and when you are disciplined to balance your sales activity, this is what your cash flow, this is what your life will look like. You're not going to have those huge peaks that you will if you were to invest 100% of your time. But eventually, what you're giving up here is the first six months of those peaks for a sustainable revenue performance over time. And there's one thing I learned very early in startups. There's this cool thing called running out of money. That's a great reminder that um, chasing uh, <laughs> deals 100% of the time is not a good idea. So balance your sales activity across each stage of the pipeline. Unbalanced sales activity is risky and unsustainable. Don't assume who will close. Come up with your own sales discipline and rhythm. And what happens is this very cool thing in pipelines, when you start to invest all your positive energy into that pipeline, without any misconception or preconception of what uh, might win and what might not, is the deals that come out, come out of the strangest places that you'd never expect. And it's the result of this positive value that accumulates in your pipeline over time. So it's kind of like watching grass grow or paint drying, right? It's hard to observe, but they both always do. Um, lastly, for today, uh, I want to talk about evangelism. Um, I see a lot of people, especially with highly innovative offerings, evangelizing people over their product. Um, I don't believe that evangelism is part of sales. Uh, I like to leave that up to marketing here. So if you find yourself educating somebody in the very basics of what you uh, do, they are not qualified to take your time. Don't invest your time training people. By the way, people will give you buying signals just to get trained for free and then walk away. If the business case, how your product fits into their organization from a workflow or use case perspective is not obvious, they're not qualified to take your time. Don't attempt to reinvent their business. If the scale of the problem does not support your price, they're not qualified to take your time. You could be solving a problem for an individual or a small group or a department, but if that doesn't support your time, uh, your price, then they're not qualified. And then lastly, is it a priority? Do they believe the problem is worth solving? Don't attempt to 
uh, change people's priorities. So do not invest your precious time educating the ill-informed or convincing skeptics. Invest your time converting knowledgeable people into customers. When a, when a prospect does not readily understand the value, the problem you solve, move up or move on. Um, I think that's, uh, I could continue here, Joe. I've got some other stuff. Uh, uh, about yeah, moving. yeah, no. Uh -huh. Thanks so much, Ken. That, that was, I mean, amazing. So many great comments in the chat and uh, some, some folks that have listened to you in the past that came back to, uh, to again, uh, listen to some, someone from Mass Challenge. Uh, so I think we can, we can stop here. Uh, there's a lot of questions. I mean, we could have a whole session on <laughs> just, uh, you know, the participants' question, but I'll pick, I'll pick three, uh, sure. maybe if, if you have a, a couple minutes. Uh, to, to just go through them. So uh, Kwame is asking, he's saying that viral uh, network and network effects are buzzwords in, in uh, B2C marketing. Uh, what are some in B2B uh, examples? Uh, well, guess what? The same thing occurs in business to business as it does the viral sort of the network effect. You know, you go into an industry and especially as a startup, you're in awe of how big and vast the industry is. And then what you discover over a career is how small and tight knit it really is, right? So the word gets around, right? On best mm -hmm. practices, great vendors that you can trust, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So even companies, uh, people in different cultures, um, you know, HR people hang out with HR people, operations people hang out with ops people in other companies, same thing with sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. Industries are much smaller than you might think. They they appear huge, but in uh, the reputation uh, that you establish within an industry through reference customers and great partner relationships uh, is is just as visceral, just as real as the um, the the network effect that you get in, in B2C. It just happens a different way. Great. Uh, next question from Christopher. He's asking, what are some signals that uh, someone is just looking for competitive intelligence? Oh, uh, I call that Peter the pocket picker, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> right. Uh, and Christopher, how are you? Deshane, I recognize you. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah. So um, when you run into somebody that's picking your pocket for competitive intelligence, you don't, you, they're asking you great questions and they're very knowledgeable, but you don't think they're going to be a buyer. You have to draw the line there and you have to ask them questions about um, their project and their project timeline and what they're actually doing. And is it a real project or are they just picking your, picking your pocket? Uh, mm -hmm. Ask them questions about, um, you know, what, well, when, uh, when was the last, um, project like this that um, they, uh, they led uh, and who did they work with. Um, also, uh, it's time to draw a line in the sand with, listen, we can, we can go on and continue and help you, but we'd really like to help you in the context of your specific needs and your specific data. So I'd like to recommend uh, a proof of concept or a pilot here mm -hmm. to get to better answers to all these. And we can do a low cost, low risk pilot, draw the line in the sand. And if they're not willing to spend five to $20,000, you're talking to somebody that's picking your pocket or mm -hmm. not qualified to take your time, draw a line in the sand. Great. So many great uh, comments here. The best presentation in B2B, awesome talk, the best HAE session I've ever attended. Someone has been in sale, Dave in sales for 40 years and great frameworks and so many uh, affirmational uh, comments here. Thank you so much, uh, Kent. Uh, maybe the last, um, the last question. You, you did mention that the founder is the most important, uh, you know, first salesperson. Uh, at what point do you get, uh, try to get, you know, outside help? Is it a product market okay. fit or is it at a certain metric? So that's a great question. And I'm going to give you a very short answer to that. Depends. No, <laughs> no. You are ready to hire your first salesperson when you can say, go out and get me a hundred more customers, just like these 12, not go out and figure out who our customer is. Awesome. 
Okay. Great way to, to end it. Regina, any uh, closing words? I'm sure everyone's excited for the session on, on Thursday. Um, this is just tremendous. And I took lots of notes. And I, I think you're right, uh, Joe. This is the preamble to Thursday. Uh, people will leave this session today really thinking hard about um, what you've been saying and how to apply it. So thanks so much. And I'm really excited that Thursday is a couple of days away. Yeah, great questions, everyone. Thanks for your time. Um, hope you walk away with a couple of things that help you. And I look forward to connecting with you again on Thursday. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Rodney, Humana, everyone attending.